Well, I'm L.J. Boots Hinton, and my father was Ted Hinton, who was the deputy sheriff. He was the last of the six officers to pass away who captured Clyde and Bonnie in Gibbon, Louisiana, May the 23rd, 1934. There was a film made immediately after the ambush. It was made on the Bell and Hound Wind Up 16 uh, that Ted carried with him all during the time that he was after Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, news photographer in Dallas with the Dallas Times Herald gave that camera to Ted and told him, says, Ted, you need to carry it with you because you're going to get them eventually, and when you do, you're going to need to document it. Ted knew Clyde because they had been Western Union messengers together. Bob Alcorn knew Clyde because he had handled it before. So they were the only two out of the six-man posse that knew them actually physically on site. Ted and Bob Alcorn tracked Money and Clyde for 17 months. They were the only two people that ever faced Clyde in a gunfight more than once and went to tell about it. Well, Ted knew both uh, the Parker and Barra families. Currently standing in front of the Bonnie and Clyde Ambush Museum. I wanted to at least show you the outside first and uh, then continue the journey into the museum as well as the, the sites where Bonnie and Clyde were ambushed at and ultimately killed. is only about five minutes or so from here. Um, so I'm going to do all that in the video and give you as much history as I can for you because it's a, I don't know, it's a very interesting piece of history. Um, just so you know, I'm not condoning at all what Bonnie and Clyde did, nor any other kind of, you know, criminals or gangsters or whoever. Um, I'm just uh, sharing a piece of history, a piece of, you know, 1930s Americana history. So I'm sure you guys will enjoy it. To those who are curious or don't really know, Bonnie and Clyde or Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow um, were a 1930s couple who were in their early 20s um, who, had, who went on a about a two-year kind of crime spree um, robbing banks, robbing stores, gas stations, and uh, ended up killing roughly about 13 people including numerous police officers in their pretty, pretty deadly uh, kind of crime spree. They kept on going for about two years or so and then were ultimately ambushed by police officers from Texas and Louisiana. I'll go into more of the ambush stuff uh, more into details when I actually get to the spot where it happened. So when you have history like this that is um, so old, um, there's a lot of different uh, truths and myths. And so it looks like Bonnie um, was 23 when she passed away and uh, According to online, it looks like Clyde was 25 when he passed away. Although in the museum, it looked like some of the articles and stuff said that the family actually said that he was born in 1910 instead of 1909, which would mean that uh, he was 24 when he passed away. So again, I don't know exactly what is true, what is not true. Um, so either way, Bonnie was definitely 23 when she passed away because her birthday was in October and she passed away in May. So she would have been 24, but she died before her birthday. And Clyde was either 24 or 25. So I had to clear that up because it was kind of confusing. So obviously very young and uh, I guess went out in their own style and their own kind of blaze of glory in a sense. Um, the reason why I'm showing you the outside of this museum is because it's actually part of the story. This museum was not always a museum, as you can imagine. <laughs> this museum uh, actually was a cafe, and honestly, I did not know this until I looked it up. However, the last moments of Bonnie and Clyde actually started that morning on May 23rd, 1934. Uh, I think they died around 9.30 a.m. or 10 a.m. I'm not sure about that, but somewhere around that. 
they went to this cafe here in Gibson, Louisiana around 8 in the morning to get food. That was the last sighting of them before they were ambushed several hours later. So this museum is actually part of the story because this used to be the cafe that they went to the morning of the ambush, the morning that they passed away. So I think that's kind of, um, I don't know, iconic, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's become a museum. Funny enough, there's actually two museums. There's a small one right there, and then there's the big one right here. This one was a cafe. This is the one that they ate at and has become the museum. Um, so this museum has so much stuff um, about Bonnie and Clyde. Lots of, you know, real true pictures um, from the time frame. And uh, newspaper articles, everything you could think of. Um, and I don't know if there's some of their clothes or something. I'll have to check it out. But uh, there's lots of stuff here. It's really, really good museum. And of course in the 1930s, um, other kind of notorious gangsters were running around, including John Dillinger, um, Babyface Nelson, and a slew of others. So this has a list of, uh, I guess, all the major events that Bonnie and Clyde were involved in. And uh, the numbers illustrate to what happened. Um, so they, they did a lot in kind of the central south United States, obviously, Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, kind of this general area. Um, and they were both from Dallas area, so that's why there's a lot around that area. And uh, Clyde was in prison for, looks like a year and a half or two years, for uh, other crimes. And when he got out, that's when he started kind of the main crime spree with Bonnie. And this is what I'm talking about. This is where uh, Clyde's brother, Buck, got killed. And uh, his wife went to prison. So it looks like the last kind of major crime before they were killed was in Oklahoma, and that's where they kill Constable and the and takes the police chief hostage. Thank you. 
So there's two cars here in the museum. Um, one was actually a, a replica car that they used in a Bonnie and Clyde movie. And uh, it says right here that a guy named Jack Turner, who was an expert marksman, actually spent two hours shooting at the car in order to make it as realistic as possible for the movie. So it's not the car that they, Bonnie and Clyde died in but it's a replica. I guess I should point out if you guys don't want to see any gruesome pictures, uh, I might want to turn away for a little bit. This is uh, some of the pictures of Bonnie and Clyde, um, obviously dead on uh, the embalming table. <laughs> So as far as I know, it looks like Clyde met Bonnie at a mutual friend's house in 1930. Bonnie was married and I think she ultimately left her husband to be with Clyde. Clyde was arrested not too long after for several um, burglaries and uh, auto thefts, I think, and actually was sentenced to 14 years um, in prison in Texas. The prison was uh, a terrible place apparently it was um, lots of bad things were going on in that prison and that's when uh, Clyde decided um, that he wanted to take revenge and uh, get not only get out of the prison but save as many of his fellow inmates as he could crazy thing happened the prison was overcrowded so Clyde and another inmate actually got pardoned and released because it was just too overcrowded. So Clyde got released, I think, in February 1932. And uh, that's when him, Bonnie, and a few other um, of his gang members, and including uh, his brother, uh, Clyde's brother, Buck, and Buck's wife, Blanche, um, they all started kind of the Bonnie and Clyde gang, so to speak. Throughout the next uh, year and a half, Bonnie and Clyde committed, you know, like I said, dozens of, of robberies, burglaries, and bank robberies, which ended up killing um, 12 people. And throughout that time, um, Clyde kept mentioning he wanted to go back to the same prison he was incarcerated at to break out um, several of his friends and former gang members. And that finally came to fruition um, January 1934, only a mere handful of months before they were both killed. Um, but the main person they were trying to break out was one of their friends named Henry Methvin. During the basically escape and breakout, Clyde and one of his gang friends then ended up shooting the guards as well. Because of Bonnie and Clyde's notoriety for killing officers and uh, the the them helping break out and shoot um, these officers or guards of the prison, they kind of elevated themselves up to like public enemies number one, so to speak. One of the retired rangers kind of made it his mission to take down Bonnie and Clyde after that happened. Um, so what kind of helped with uh, the ambush was the fact that Henry Methvin, the guy that the, that Bonnie and Clyde helped break out of prison, he ended up kind of turning on Bonnie and Clyde, and so he he wanted a full pardon 
of the breakout and, and any other crimes he was committing. He wanted a full pardon, and so in exchange for that pardon, he helped several officers uh, set up this ambush. Um, I did not know that until I looked it up. The guy that Von Hankel had helped get out of prison, he ended up setting up this ambush to kill them. And, and what's crazy was that Henry Methvin uh, actually uh, was with Bonnie and Clyde pretty much up until the ambush time. Um, he kind of created an excuse uh, and left them, I guess, sometime around the time frame of the ambush. He made up an excuse and left and uh, because he knew that Bonnie and Clyde would meet back up with him at his parents' house. Um, so the officers knew uh, that uh, Methvin's father's house was nearby and they knew that Bonnie and Clyde would be coming around somewhere in that area towards that house to meet back up with Methvin. May 21st, 1934, the officers basically set up a perimeter ambush site on one of the main roads leading through Gibsland um, down near um, Henry Methvin's father's house. Officers were waiting in the in the bushes for several days, waiting and waiting and waiting. Bonnie and Clyde rolled into Gibsland, Louisiana. They went to this cafe on May 23rd, 1934, um, around 8 or 9 a.m. Several hours later, they traveled through and were ambushed, obviously, on that site. Okay guys, I'm at the, the spot where the ambush happened. So reading tons of online reports, uh, lots of uh, different news articles and different stuff like that, I think I've pieced together uh, the, the direction of travel that Bonnie and Clyde were driving in and where uh, the six patrol officers, uh, where they were setting up at in the tree line, uh, waiting for to ambush Bonnie and Clyde. I think I've pieced together where they were in terms of Bonnie and Clyde and stuff like that. Behind me, that heading that direction is Gibsland, Louisiana, which is where the cafe was that Bonnie and Clyde ate at the morning of their deaths. So Bonnie and Clyde were coming up this hill. They're heading from Gibsland, Louisiana. They're heading this way towards me up this hill heading this direction and as far as I know I think the patrol officers were in this tree line on the other side of the road not this side of the road where my RV is but they were on the other side of the road facing us so Bonnie and Clyde were driving this direction where I'm walking and um, Henry Methvin's father, like I said, he lived nearby. Um, and in order to set up the ambush, um, Henry Methvin's father actually had his car somewhere around here broken down. It was more of a setup, it wasn't really broke down. But uh, Bonnie and Clyde recognized Henry Methvin's father's car, and so they slowed down to take a look and see what was going on. And it was kind of blocking this part of the road. So I think Bonnie and Clyde's car kind of ended up on this side of the road, closer to where the patrolmen were in the woods, or like right over here. So I think they were driving, they saw his car, they kind of moved over, and were sort of in this area, and where the patrol officers were shooting. Again, that is my best guess, my best interpretation of everything that I've been reading. Um, it's so much information and history to go through, and obviously there's so many different reports and, and different people's opinions. And how did they know that it was Clyde? That's real simple. No one but Clyde Barrett drove a dadgum tan Ford V8 at 80 to 90 miles an hour down gravel roads. Ted and Bob Alcorn both knew him by sight. Clyde had pulled up there, had shifted in the first gear, and Alcorn hollered halt. Clyde's head went up, Bonnie screamed. Ted had a BAR, which carries 20 rounds fully automatic. 
had a Remington automatic shotgun, automatic, carried six rounds. Uh, Prentice Oakley, the chief deputy down there at Bienville Parish, he got buck fever and snapped off two shots. And with that, everyone unloaded. Bonnie was hit 53, Clyde was hit 51. On the uh, roll ridge on the door, there are five evenly spaced bullet holes. Those five rounds right there were Ted's first shots. While Bonnie and Clyde are still in the car, they're leaning against each other in the front seat and they're cleaning out the rest of the car and everything. And uh, of course his guns and everything are leaning up against the back bumper of the car. It says on the plaque they were killed around 9.15 or that's when they started shooting or something like that. Um, so they must have finished up at the cafe, you know, somewhere around, you know, 8.45, 8.50, something like that. And then we're heading this direction. Um, and other reports said that Bonnie actually had part of a sandwich that she had from the cafe. She had that with her in the car. So again, that gives kind of a good timeline where they were wrapping up eating at the cafe and were coming this direction. And definitely give my respects uh, to all the people that were killed by Bonnie and Clyde. Um, Bonnie and Clyde were both buried in Dallas, Texas, I believe. So um, I'll try to maybe do a separate video probably on Bonnie and Clyde's uh, kind of gravestones and uh, some other sites around Texas if I have time. So stay tuned probably for some of those videos. Um, thanks for watching, guys. More abandoned stuff coming up, so don't worry about that. And until next time, don't forget to live, explore, and travel.